Come with us as we visit Salt Lake City, a harvest host in Nevada, and a strange Indian monument off of I-80. Next, it was time for Salt Lake City. We decided to park Lanyap downtown, get out, and explore a bit on foot. We had a chance to check out the LDS church grounds, and the architecture of the tabernacle was as amazing as you might think. The grounds were massive and immaculate. It felt like what I would imagine visiting the Vatican feels like on a much smaller scale, of course. It's very relaxing and peaceful. A lot of shady areas to sit and just enjoy the flowers. After checking out downtown and the church grounds, we headed to the Beer Hive, only a few blocks away from the Tabernacle. It's very regulated and controlled in Salt Lake City, and it felt weird drinking a beer only a few blocks away from the Tabernacle. We met a couple who lived there, and they shared some insights on what it's like to live in the area and gave us an idea of some things to visit in Nevada as we were preparing for our next day's trip. It was a really fun time. Sorry about that. <laughs> right on it. Oh, it's about to watch the area for some reason. After having beer and nachos, we decided to spend part of our day at the Antelope Island State Park, which is a peninsula that extends out into the Great Salt Lake. It's a very barren place, but a lot of bison. And by the way, Penelope did save us from the bison, as you'll see. <laughs> Next we showed up at the Deseret Peak Alpaca Farm. We stayed overnight and got a great tour from the owner Terry. You can see here that Lolo's on top of Lanyap trying to figure out what happened with our fantastic fan. We ended up having to tape it down and we're going to have to get that repaired soon. Not so fantastic. Two guys that come out and grab an alpaca, literally lift it up and take it in the barn, lie it down or lay it down. Yeah. Like, lay it down, and then they'll stretch the feet out. So it's like this when they when they shear it because alpacas wow. don't want to sit still like a I bet. sheep does. Do uh, alpaca spit the way the uh, yeah. they do the same? But they're they're not as uh, hostile as a llama. They use, when they spit, they're usually spitting at each other. You just happen to get in the way, and it's more of an, uh, I'm gonna call it a respiratory spit. You yeah. know, when they're really upset, it comes from way down, and it smells so bad. <laughs> <laughs> 
dark green and just, I mean, it's oh. out the other, yeah, yeah. terrible. <laughs> and when it's, uh, when it's shearing time, you always catch them and hold them uh, away from them. Yeah, <laughs> I <laughs> bet you that's that, the time. that real quick. <laughs> Terry, what was your name one more time? Terry, Terry Stapley. Stapley, S-T-A-P-L-E. okay. And we really enjoy staying at your, at your farm here. This is an experiment we're trying this year. Last year, this was an aquaponics greenhouse deep water system, like I'll show you. And we were going to move this greenhouse over behind the big one yeah. and extend it. So we said, well, before we try it, before we do that, let's try this. So we put the Dutch bucket in. I put the tomato plants in. Um, this is what the plant looked like on June 20th. Oh, wow. Poop in the water. And there's a bacteria that changes the, the ammonia into a nitrite and there's another naturally occurring bacteria that changes the nitrite into a nitrate which is what plants pull out of the ground when they're growing that's wow. the total of it. and so I, I there's a pump pumping water into this one pump pumping water into that one and it hits a certain point there's a stand pipe in here Oh, oh wow, okay. And it runs down and into that two inch and then flows back into the fish pond. That is pretty cool. You don't really need uh, fertile soil for this. You know, if you know how to do this, you're. Uh... You don't have to worry about <laughs> yeah. the soil. Yeah. You don't have to worry about what you never, it's Never any weeding soil. except along the floor. Yeah. And what I have found is I'm not getting enough water flow. I've got a 300 gallon an hour pump on each system. But it's not, I'm not getting good flow all the way to the end. Okay. So what happened is they, they boomed up. And now you can see they're kind of down in the middle. Yeah. And we are getting the top of the again. So it's like, okay, what's going on? <laughs> in, the, in the road. Deep water grow beds, we have an air stone every 10 feet to aerate the, the water okay. to the oxygen of the plants roots to the oxygen. Alright. You know, this is what's really exciting. You know, aquaponics is 95, at least 95% more water efficient than growing in the dirt. And I can get three crops by the time anybody that grows in the dirt gets wet. Wow. Just you can act produce out really quick. Yeah. You know, Leafy greens are just amazing, you know, your spinaches, lettuce, uh, kale, blah, blah, blah. We've, we've actually done corn, we've done uh, radishes, we've done beets. Uh, I'll show you a tomato plant we did in the other greenhouse. Oh my gosh. Wow. That's like at the um, <laughs> the greenhouse at the sand dunes. Oh yeah, right. Uh oh, something popped out maybe. Mm. This is July twenty second. Oh wow, they're already so big. That just yeah. Boom. Yeah. It's, so it's a couple, what, three or three like weeks. I said, this is an experiment. On July 22nd, we also had tomatoes already. So in a month and two days, I went from that to that. This is my yeah. wife's Abby. Hi, Lola. Hi, Lola. Penelope. Penelope. Hello. I'm Matt. Hi, Penelope. Good to meet you. You just want to say hello to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, what was your name? Matt. Matt. She wants Matt. to get Sam. Oh, you are the cat. Yeah, the alpacas didn't like her. <laughs> yeah. Three, four years ago, we had a 90 mile an hour microburst, and it actually picked up this greenhouse. Wow. We put it on top of that. Oh, wow. These poles were sticking in the roof right, right smack dab in the middle, all the way down through. Wow. Just when they all, they all came, the wings going from south, they all fell in this way when they fell in, and the wind got under. And it literally lifted it up. Wow. In here we have uh, sweet greens, radishes, kale, carrots, different types of peppers, anaheim, bell, uh, this is a jalapeno, 
squash. If you see the big ring things down there, uh -huh. those, those came from the squash back. Oh wow! We didn't plant those; they were in the squash back. Wow! And big greens over here also. Spinach, spinach, uh, cucumber, butternut squash. And Terry, how how did you say that? This is, you had mentioned that uh, you're working with uh, sex trafficking victims. Do they work some here too as well? Is yes. that okay? Yes. They they each have a responsibility. Uh, we let them pick and choose if they want to work in the dirt, if they want to work in the greenhouse. Yeah. If they want to work with the animals. It's like the one we have now. She wants to work with horses. So. And what we did is we dug a hole in back, 65 feet long, 16 feet wide, and 8 feet deep. Buried 2,000 feet of four-inch pipe. And there's a squirrel cage fan down there just to the right of the door. And it blows air into those pipes and it goes all the way through. They're wow. actually 500 feet each. Or yeah, five, 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 five. And it takes two minutes and 40 seconds for it to get to this pipe. And so when it comes out of this pipe, it's 57 degrees year-round. Wow. Dead on 57 year-round. And so it never freezes in here. Wow. The air is How did you learn to do all this stuff? Yeah. Somebody else has done it somewhere along yeah, the way, I right? Yeah. The Idaho prepper is what it is, and he shows how he did his. And, wow. You know, it's a certain. You need a certain feet of pipe for the sport, the cubic footage of your greenhouse. A lot of it's the measurements and making yes. sure you get all that stuff and right. So and, we yeah. needed 1950, so we put in 2000. All right. Sure. Yeah, we're we're vegetable people. Oh my gosh. <laughs> this will feed you for a week. <laughs> that's, that's a big one, man. <laughs> you don't you don't find them like that in the grocery store. Been for a long time because they use it to. Uh, yeah. Oh, it's delicious. I keep doing That's great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's not salty. Yeah. You want some? Penelope? Penelope, you want some? Look. Look. You want some? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and in the, in the corner over here, which we'll go to okay. now, is our top tank. There's about, I guess it's 80. Two and a half pound trout in there. Rainbow trout. Wow. My record is seven pounds so far. And you're growing them here for and for the hydroponics. Wow. It's That's pretty. It's a seven pounder. They they filter the water. They okay. They they the same as over here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Fertilize, fertilize the plant. The water water drops out of the tank into this trough and then flows down. So it's just like a stream goes down and comes back, drops out there and gets pumped back to the fish tank. That's pretty amazing. This is what I use to heat the water in the wintertime. It's called a rocket stove, which is a thermal mass heater, wood fired. I'm going to hook it up to, I'm going to make me a little auger for pellets. So I can run it all night because I oh, usually okay. run it from seven in the morning until ten or eleven at night, and I, and I stoke it with coal, and it will still be warm. But wow. They use this a lot in Europe, and they'll heat their homes with it because they'll, they'll build like a cob bench on the outlet, so it's always warm. Plus, it's a heat sink, so it holds the heat for a long time. Wow! And this thing's an animal. <laughs> I can, I can have, imagine. I've had the top <laughs> eleven hundred degrees. Oh my God. I can boil water with this in 10 minutes. And there's 100 feet of stainless steel pipe that are coiled inside of it. But the, the fire never gets to the pipe. There's, a, there's this, and then there's a 16 gallon drum inside of that. And, uh, air, uh, Multiple two, cores two inch, <laughs> inside there. Huh? Two inch airspace and then a 10 inch drill stem. 
Okay. The drill stem is really heavy steel. And the fire goes up the drill stem, hits the top, and then the, the, the excess goes over and down the sides to the it. It's really, really efficient. The only thing, you know, they can have burn days. I can burn this all year long. They have no burn days, I should say. Uh, but this, all it does is it commits, uh, it emits uh, water vapor. Burns okay. everything up and just emits water vapor. Wow. Never any smoke from it unless you're burning coal. We'll see if they're hungry this morning. <laughs> the answer's probably all yes. <laughs> Maybe. Oh yeah. Those are some big kids. They're two and a half years old. What is that, Penelope? I might eat you up too. <laughs> This size, which is really the key, good size for you. And then uh, two days later, it'll be almost like this. It's just big. Wow. So our customers this week are going to get zucchinis. <laughs> Everything floats on water. Okay. Wow. That's amazing. And you see them in all stages here too. Never, yeah, never any weeding. We have this lettuce has gone to, to seed already. We've got new lettuce here, kale, new lettuce, celery, celery, celery. Not seasoned. Okay. That is. Who would have thunk it, huh? <laughs> the celery. Anyways. Salt Lake City we met a young couple who told us a few sites that we might want to see along the way the first being Thunder Mountain uh, somewhat it's a Native American monument of sorts uh, in Emily Nevada just off of I-80 it was built over a number of years by a World War II vet named Frank Van Zandt he later changed his name to Chief Rolling Thunder in 1968 he and his wife and eight kids moved to Emily as he believed that's where the great spirit wanted him to be he began covering his travel trailer in concrete that he sculpted into odd shapes, incorporating pieces of furniture, bottles, etc. He made several different statues and proved to have some talent for working with con concrete. Um, after covering his trailer, he began to build the monument, which eventually reached three stories high, and it was topped with these crazy white loop things, circles. Once his uh, son Dan asked him why he put those on top of the, of the monument, and he said at the end of times, the great spirit would swoop down and grab this place by the handle, <laughs> and I guess take it to heaven or wherever. Uh, in the 70s, Chief Rolling Thunder began to attract followers, and at one time he had up to 40 people living there, people he may have taken advantage of financially, it seems, because as they began to move away in, in the 80s, the chief became more desperate and more destitute. He began selling his collection of Native American artifacts. Sadly, he eventually burned down all of the buildings except the monument itself. In 1989, his wife and his second batch of kids moved away from the compound. Later that year, he wrote a letter to his oldest son, Dan, and shot himself. 
Now Dan tries to maintain and protect the site as a testament to his father's passions for Native American history.